Welcome back to Queer Justice. Earlier in our episode, we provide you statistics and facts around media censorship by foreign governments, especially on liberal content, activism, and even LGBT rights, which is often seen as propaganda. For our sit down with our guests today, we invited two individuals who are queer artists and are working to change the narrative of queer people in different regions of the world. They will discuss with us the vital importance of diverse content in the media and how to respond to the censorship about the issues that affect our community. Welcome, Daniel and John. So before we begin today, can we all provide our gender pronouns? He, him. He, him. Okay, and I'll go by they, them. Thank you for sharing. So let's give our lovely audience a full scope of who you are and the amazing work you are doing. So Daniel, help me with that last name. Spriglio. <laughs> Daniel Spriglio, born in Connecticut, went for the social justice and applied drama track at the University of Minnesota's theater art program and currently is in New York City as a queer playwright and postgrad conservatory student at the Atlantic Theater Company, acting school affiliated with NYU Tisch, where he's working on a play based on their experience of queer activism in Senegal, West Africa. An interesting fact is their sister is transgender and, as and asexual with autism spectrum disorder, but is also their best friend. John Kilberg, born in New York City and studied film and performance art at SCAD in Savannah, Georgia, is a queer documentarian and queer and creator of a series called Personal All, which gives a voice to people who live in America by saying, yes, they live there, yes, their voice is valid, and we should respect different people in this country and they ought to be represented equally. A recent documentary they made is on the drag queen, Bitch Pudding, and how she was inspired to do drag having been raised in a military family. Both John and Daniel are part of Voices for a global queer movement conducting nonviolent art demonstrations to address human rights violations by governments across the world. They are also involved in the video and research team as part of the Grassroots Millennial Group. See, I'm allowed to screw up and then I edit it down. <laughs> now for some questions. What inspires your work and activism despite knowing that it could be met with rejection and stigma stigmatization because of your queerness? Either one. Um, I would say it's actually because of my queerness um, that I feel called to, to do activism like that. Uh, I know that I have a platform and I have the resources to, you know, uh, make my voice heard and therefore to amplify the voice of others. Um, it, it really, like, it, it's, it's kind of one of the, I don't know, motivating um, foundations of, of my life and everything I do. As well as your art? Oh, yeah, especially my art. Mm. Um, and what about you, John? I would say what inspires me is definitely the fire that I have that is, I know there are people who want to know the truth about who lives in this country and regardless of exactly who they are. I know there is a core group of people that want to hear this because people can feel that there are lies and um, misconstrued images of people that should be br honestly broken down. Um, and granted, there are the people who don't, and they feel me too, because I hope to not change minds, but at least put a thought or a wedge in their mind that might be something out of what they're used to thinking and, and be more accepting. And is your art and politics separate? It's like, are they both viewed well, in the they same got thing? They, they definitely got connected. Um, they, they weren't normally, uh, and then I would definitely say after the election, mm. I it just, I kind of, it sparked and I snapped mm. <laughs> to want to connect and help what I feel like is eroding this country that doesn't need, it doesn't need that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Daniel, what was the moment in your artistic and activist journey that prompted you to create a play about your experience with underground queer activism in Senegal? <laughs> um, well, I, uh, I, I was thinking about the issue in Senegal, uh, Sorry, I, I was thinking about the issue in Senegal and you during were studying a class. abroad? Um, yeah, well, okay, so I, I actually started the idea before doing a abroad trip. Um, I was in a class on international human rights law, um, and we were to write a sort of like mock um, letter to the UN about a certain issue, um, and I focused on the human rights violations in Senegal, which had been increasing in the last few years. Like what? What violations? Um, just that there were men, you know, um, 
a, a lot of times, you know, being captured or, or arrested. There was there was one instance where sev about seven men, I think, were accused of homosexuality because um, of basically being in the same room together. And then, like later, a condom was found. There was some um, some you know magazine or something. And one of the men's mothers called you know the police, and they were all arrested without um, a fair trial. Uh, and and the amount of instances like this um, really spiked from like 2000, ar around 2008, I would say was, was probably the the climax. Um, and then they sort of plateaued, and there's there have been a lot of um, incidents. Sometimes you know as many as as 11 men at a, at a time, or just you know men being accosted on the street by police, forced to admit you know homosexuality, then arrested. And um, and how do you think? a play would serve justice on that issue? Mm. Well, the Why a play versus a film or The thing about poetry? film, um, you know, mainstream film, um, especially produced here, is it doesn't necessarily get um, seen, you know, in a country like Senegal. And major blockbuster films, there, you know, there might be, you know, awareness um, in the capital city, you know, um, maybe, but across the country there's really, um, you know, not a lot of access to Western media in that way. Um, so you're planning to do some play readings yeah. in Senegal. So uh, the other issue too is that um, in the local media there really is no platform um, for these activists to communicate. So I, you know, I wonder if like theater can be used as, as um, a way to get their message across to kind of cut through that censorship um, and also to create awareness here, you know, as maybe a, a method of, of fundraising. Um, for more, you know, targeted um, efforts within Senegal, which I think, you know, social media can play a part in that, and, um, you know, I, I think news, radio, like, there, there, there are multiple platforms, but I think it, it's sort of a, a starting point for fundraising and also for in-person um, education. But I'm also curious to know that it seems like the media does know where to attack these, like, gay activists, but at the same time, it's not easy. So how did you easily come across these group of activists? Um, so actually, I did not come across them very easy. I was there for about four months before I found, um, you know, the activists who ended up being really central to my research. Um, there, there really is, you know, all of the mainstream uh, established human rights organizations in Senegal really avoid talking about homosexuality. And it was through another um, another study abroad program, which was a little bit more progressive than my own, um, had them come in and, and do sort of their own panel discussion. Um, and I, you know, I went up to them afterward and got the contact information and was able to come in and you know, do some interviews of my own with them. Um, but there's, yeah, there's really, it, it's hard for people to find them and, and they actually haven't been the, the activists targeted, you know, for violence. It's more so the average citizen who's just kind of accused of homosexuality by by a family member or, or you know, um, and someone this is in not their only life. in Senegal. I know no, about totally. stories in Iran, in across the Middle East, across Africa, across Russia. Like yeah. there was not long ago an Iraqi celebrity that because he has long hair in Baghdad, you know, they assume that means gay, and mm -hmm. he was actually married with a wife and three kids, and like, some of these hustlers on the street just like killed him. And like, just all from the assumption of like, your gender equates, your gender expression equates sexuality, and it's, it's scary, and like, I mean, especially in Africa where you're like, people's names are being published in newspapers, mm -hmm. and it's like, these are the 100 gays of today that need right. to be attacked. And like you now know where they live, you now know what they look like, you now have this horrible biased story about them that makes you believe like, oh my God, I need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And it's it's scary, like you, it's like no like protection over your citizenship and your identity and privacy. Like yeah. you're just existing, even if you hide yourself, like you're out there, like you don't have a choice. Well, the other thing too is that, um, you know, the average citizen is also being encouraged by the media, in Senegal at least, um, and by religious figures uh, to enact violence. That, that it's, it's almost, you know... Um, Holy. They're almost called 
to you know to to show that that in at least in, in the context of Senegal that it's that it's not welcome and that um, I mean the other thing too is you know there's a, there's a very specific history in Senegal it's it's um, 95% Muslim and historically very peaceful, but increasingly kind of radicalizing um, and on this subject. And did you go to Senegal knowing about this community that's affected? I did. Or you just happened to stumble across them as you went no, there? No, yeah. Th um, my, I, I was fortunate that my school had a longstanding program in Senegal called the, the Minnesota Study of International Development. Um, but I did specifically go there with the intent to, to work on this issue. And I actually had to fight um, to get a research grant because they knew that it was you know, illegal and that there were risks involved. And I was living with a host family, so everything kind of had to be kept very secretive. Um, but you know, that, that's exactly why I wanted to do it. You know, as I said before, it's sort of um, you know, knowing that I have the platform and, and that, and that I, you know, we are all part of the queer community. Um, I really thank you for that, because like, yeah. a lot of people wouldn't care. A lot of people like, it's mm -hmm. all about me and my lives. Mm -hmm. And like, we live in this one world. and so much of the privilege we have here, even if we're like trying to make by, you know, or get through, you know, um, we could use that for someone else that has none at all to breathe, to right. stand. Mm -hmm. So let's watch some of the work that John has been producing through um, their platform, Personal All, or Person All? Uh, Person All. Person All, okay, and then let's discuss, okay? Dividing us right now is that people feel like they're not being represented. Not being heard. And they're not being heard. So that's... And that's for everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gender neutrality means that there are no rules. Gender is about rules. It's about abiding by rules and outlines and guidelines, very strict guidelines written by decades, centuries, millennia old society. It should be a human right for freedom of speech. So I just always hope that there are spaces available for people to make art because that is a form of freedom of speech. I feel like the concept of being an American has aged me more than the concept of living. I have to change what I did if we stopped expressing ourselves. Women have more freedom with what they wear because of society's stigmas men can't really accept it so men basically have t-shirts and shirts and pants and shorts and things of that nature it's a more limited range and you don't get to have that much fun for lack of a better word with most menswear um so it moves slower because at the end of the day you're really just like developing and taking something and moving it forward not creating something like totally out of left field for me perfection um, means symbiosis, it means peace, it means harmony. Perfection lies within the imperfection of everything. I moved here in 1999. Yeah. I started first grade here. I was seven years old. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I've always gone to Paraguay back and forth, so I think that's why, that's why I uh, meshed with my identity a little bit more. The fact that I was still being exposed to a lot of uh, a lot of Paraguayan culture at the same time, as well as American culture, but of course school and what is expected from someone who's from another country. Okay, so John, can you explain mm -hmm. a little bit about what we watched mm -hmm. and areas of underrepresentation you covered and will cover? Um, so, Basically, the first thing that we saw was a bit of a montage of what I've done in the past. Um, that the, all those videos happened. I mean, the past, uh, that's an odd term, because th that's like 2016, 2017. I just started around then. Um, and around then, I just you know, um, had my phone. I didn't have a steady cam. I didn't have a light. I didn't do mics. I mean, everything was just like on my phone, raw. Um, in that video, we saw people talking about how gender really affects fashion. And, um, you know, we, we kind of really got deep with that because, you know, fashion, yes, is a high marketing image. It's image-based, period. Um, luxury, you could say. But fashion really ultimately does determine a lot of what happens in society, uh, period. Also, um, fashion has 
such a power to be able to dismantle it and yes. yet it's still yes. promoting this very binary view that like all women want to wear dresses and be feminine right. all men want to be rugged and butch and plaid shirts but right so like it was it's very interesting because it does affect other uh, members of our society outside of the queer um, society but it still affects the queer society because it's happening to a, a woman or a man and they might be cis or straight or however, whatever, it's still going to affect and we all affect each other and that is what I'm trying to connect with is to show that we all affect each other mm. and we all are stronger to work together. Um, and uh, so yeah, that was that, that first clip. Um, the second clip w went deeper into the gender neutrality, which was a really, really, really great piece. That was Devin Rufo. He's a designer for Rag and Bone, um, a gay man as well, um, fantastic uh, designer, really trying to um, dress and bring clothing to not only men, but women and both. I mean, he's all about wanting to find the fluidity of clothing and mm. I'm all for it. Um, and the third thing we saw was Alien in America. Um, Brian, he's, I, um, he doesn't really label himself, so I don't want to say, you know, gay or straight. He doesn't really have a label. Um, but it was very powerful talking to him about that because he's an immigrant trying to, you know. Uh, Where is he from again? From, from Paraguay. Okay. Um, his family from Paraguay, and, you know, they really built a life here. And I, you know, thought it'd be powerful to show him going around um, the Statue of Liberty to remind people that, like, you know, we are the we are the country that allows immigrants. And this is a whole other thing. But you know, um, this country I saw on uh, at Brighton Beach Pride on Sunday. You know, um, immigrants make America great, and I get what they're doing. It's a pun on the hand uh, on, on the line on the hat, sure. But in retrospect, uh, immigrants make America because technically mm. we are. I mean, li literally, it's, it's so, I don't, yeah. It's not, it's not making America great. Literally, immigrants are America, period. Yes. Point and simple. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Like, uh, unless you're Native American, then uh, <laughs> this right. is your home. <laughs> we stole the land <laughs> right. from. I'm sorry, it's just, it's honestly the real tea. Right. And I don't want to make it so, like, uh, um, So, two yeah. things. Yeah. What are other areas of yes. underrepresentation you want to work on? Um, so I am going to do a follow-up video. Uh, my friend that we saw who did the cute face, uh, that's my really good friend, um, and I was showing him before his transformation very much. Um, As a trans man. Yes, and so I'm going to go deeper into um, how it is after everything, the pros and the cons. I mean, I want to find it all. I really want to show what it's like to go after, uh, through all that um, experiences of top surgery, uh, I know that he chose not to do other parts of surgery, why or why not, and to give them a voice to explain themselves. Um, I am going to do a piece on Voices for to show also how communities are in your area and hopefully make it a piece to show that, you know, someone like me, I didn't even know that they were around. I, I found them. I'm so glad I found them because it's a connection. It's a group. It's people who believe in the same thing, and I hope to make that video for so people can because I don't think a lot of people know that these organizations are around. So it would be great for people to know that they are there and it's easy to just get involved and be passionate about it. To the both of you, what is the importance of having queer representation in the media and what are some healthy and poor examples you refer to? Daniel. Um, I would say the importance, uh, you know, is that when you, when you don't have, um, you know, accurate representation and uh, in, in the media you, you have people you know, who, out of, out of sheer ignorance, you know, um, may, you know, fear queer people or, uh, you know, particularly in, in cases like Senegal, um, you know, just have these, these myths built up um, that, that uh, somehow, you know, the, the, the gay community or accepting the gay community means like losing your, your culture, um, or you know that that we're like the Trojan horse of globalization, <laughs> um, and and the other the other problem you know is that you don't I mean you can't talk about sexuality um, healthily in the media um, or or you know anywhere really then you know it's much harder to deal with things like uh, the spread of HIV and um, safe sex habits and you know when people are hiding their identities um, you know and, and sexuality itself. Is is a secret, 
then you know um, things aren't out in the open, things are hidden, everything is kind of more um, touch and go, I don't know. And, and, and we see that really um, kind of in a lot of parts of Africa it really does contribute to um, the spread of HIV and, and, and when it is dealt with and when it's out, you know, and um, talked about in the open, the you know, rates of, the, of infection really go down. Um, obviously, violence goes down when people, you know, know that, that uh, you know, LGBT people are also people. So it um, aligns with that. Yeah. There's someone here at the network that, like, we had a conversation not long ago because we were doing recording in this area and, like, just walking in this area, how much discrimination, harassment that I deal with every day. And, like, these are people that are carrying crosses or religious symbols and it's supposed to be all about love. And he was telling me... Um, how he grew up in Dominican Republic and how he come from a Catholic family and like how people have this very one-sided view of gay people he was told as a kid like they're going to rape you they're going to take you they're going to haunt you right. and then he had like a moment when he's like came to the States and like started working here with other queer people like oh wait there are people like they're not going to kidnap me. And I'm like, no, I think I'm going to be more afraid of you kidnapping me, right. you know? So it is very much true of like the narrative that we build in our heads and the media really contributes to that. And that's why, unfortunately, as he was mentioning, like nearly every day, as you see all across the world, like he mentioned like a story of like a guy literally stopped his car and took out a bat so he could kill like a trans person, all because of like this story he built for himself that promoted hate for that person that he doesn't even know, you know? And that person has to lose their life because of it. Mm -hmm. So, and what about you, John? Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, the, the main, it's, it's through, uh, the media needs to represent queer culture. I mean, it does because, I mean, it's like saying, let's not watch about the Pope, let's not watch about the president, let's not watch about your mayor. I mean, it's like you're ignoring people who are living here. So I don't understand why we wouldn't want to have representation in the media. Um, just today, actually, I just noticed that in Ireland, a guy, I don't know the name specifically, but I'm sure if you Google it, you'll find it right away, because I found out really, yep, uh, this kid posted a, a beautiful photo of him kissing his boyfriend on, on Instagram, mm. and it was completely taken down, um, and people in Ireland are like really upset. Like, well, the, the, uh, definitely the, the queer society of, of Ireland is booming, people are fighting back, they don't understand why, and so actually it just happened today, and it's, odd that that's happening today um there is a lot of we'll talk more about that there's a lot yes, of censorship uh, on just like saying the word gay on yeah. facebook but um but yeah so so yeah so the media needs i mean like so we need this moment if that was to happen to have in the media why is it happening like that's the point of uh, of of having news and having you know a, a source to listen to is because you know people can talk about these topics. And, and what know. is the unhealthy result of lack of representation? I mean, it's just ignoring what's there to the max. To like the, the ma most I mean, it's literally manipulating a person's viewpoint of life. It's not mm. even like so now you're just literally blinding someone, mm. and that's another thing that is just terrible because I mean, like, yes, this they is the world you live in. Yeah, and, and they could be you know straight or cis, whatever, like. An average citizen, yeah, they don't I deserve to be blind as well. I think you'll find this funny. I was doing research and like um, Logo TV, they have like an outlet, outlet called Global Ally, mm. like promoting through media, like queer visibility. So it was a short clip of like, what does uh, queer censorship look like? And it was basically like RuPaul coming down the runway, but like their face was blocked, their body was blocked. <laughs> you only see the stage and the wig. <laughs> and I'm really like, good, really oh my God, I had a little moment yeah. in the library in the Bronx <laughs> because I was like, I love RuPaul. How could anyone like block them or blind them? But like, it's like, what are you? Uh, it feels like a black mirror moment. It's yes. like, you're, you're telling me that I can't look at anything blue anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's part of this world. And if you want to function and know how to communicate in this world, like, this is the world you live in, whether you like it or not. Right. Like, we hopefully have to work together for peace. I don't know. Right. I don't know if there's peace. You both do good work with Voices For, a nonviolent activist group using direct action to fight for queer liberation. I want us to take a look on their mission and then discuss. I'm Adam Eli, and I'm with Voices for Chechnya. 
I'm Lyosha. I'm co-president of the LGBT, Russian-speaking LGBTIQ American Association. A big part of my education and family life was discussions around anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. When I heard that people were being rounded up and murdered for who they were, a sort of like internal trigger in my consciousness went off and I knew that it was time to act. I had been told all of my life Never again, never again, and here we were. In March 2017, the very disturbing news broke. Then people were detained uh, and they were put in, uh, in the cell in uh, abandoned places and tortured by electric shock, tortured by uh, some kind of fire and with all of these, you know, medieval uh, instruments and some of them managed to escape and they gave testimony secretly anonymously to their friends who are still here in New York so that's why we started receiving a lot of um, news about what's going on. The bedrock of my activism is the idea that people do care and people want to show up they just don't always know how. As an activist it's our job to figure out really easily accessible ways for people to contribute and then spread that word on social media. When the news was coming out about Chechnya, everyone I knew was devastated. They were all posting and like freaking out and asking me what to do, but I, there was no concrete action. But I believed in my heart that if we gave people a concrete action, they would show up and they would do it. So that's where the idea of the march was birthed from. And the basic goal is to demand American government to open up the gate and provide those people who are escaped from Chechnya to let uh, into the United States with humanitarian parole visas. In addition to demand humanitarian visas, we are trying to raise money to create a resettlement fund because a lot of people who come from former Soviet Union countries, they're struggling, they're st literally starving and they have no place to go. We have to just educate people and let them know you're not alone. I came up with the idea for the march and then the group really birthed itself. We had a planning meeting and a group was just, a group was just sort of formed because in order to have the march, we needed a few things. We needed a website, we needed a mission statement and we needed a social media presence. And those are also the same keystones that you need for a group. So it just sort of happened. And I think it happened because everyone that showed up came in like barreling through the door with so much enthusiasm and so much excitement and so many resources that they were willing to like yield and use that how could we not start a group with like all the magic that we had. Let's uh, organize and this group particular Voices for Chechnya it's a real example how people can stand together facing some challenges even though they're not directly connected to uh, Chechen people, but they are outraged because they see what's going on in their country. So people's power is the most um, outrageous power in the world. It's a way of saying to queer immigrants that we're here and we love you. After the march on October 14th, we will continue to use direct action activism to fight for the liberty and dignity of LGBTQ people all around the world. So, how has a millennial grassroots queer organization been able, in your opinion, to successfully put pressure on the US, the UN, and even foreign governments on issues like death camps in Russia, using social media and activism? And what can we learn from their accomplishments? Um, I would say one of the things that makes voices so effective, um, which, you know, it's hard to say now, quite how effective, um, it's, you know, it's something we'll, we'll have to see in the long run, but um, is, you know, a skill that we have as millennials to use social media and mm -hmm. um, to make our own, um, you know, media coverage to, to make sure that when we have demonstrations that, they're, that they are seen, um, you know, to make things viral, to use hashtags, to make a striking image that resonates with people. Um, and, you know, it, we're, we're starting to get attention and, and you know, I, there, there was um, some movement around the issue with Ali Farouz and I don't know if you can speak to that, but um, there's, there's a, you know, a lot of energy behind it. I think people are really um, excited to be able to go a little bit further than slacktivism, <laughs> um, you know, because we really do want to make a difference 
And um, yeah, there's that, that combination of, of online and, and physical presence. Thank you. John? Uh, if I could say one thing, it's probably the fact that it's nonviolent because in my opinion, I don't think violence will get you anywhere. So I think a very strong fact is that their demonstrations are more about the meaning, the message and the power and the feeling and all of that, rather than like attacking somebody. Force and anger is not gonna have people go, oh yes, I see you. It's only gonna make them see you because they wanna probably hit you. And I don't think that's gonna get anyone anywhere. So if I could say one thing that, and, and exactly, exactly that we don't know how far it's gone yet, um, but the fact that it's nonviolent. I was looking, I was reading a few months ago a uh, Time Magazine um, article, and it was about like the progress with Chechnya, and there was a mm. timeline, and uh, there was no mention of Voices 4, but I was mm. like looking at all these like different pinpoints, and it was like, it was really due, sorry, to their work, of like getting, you know, the UN ambassador to be able to like call out Chechnya, to like ban them from like coming to America, to having the media talk about it. And like still on like a global level, you know, the media is talking about it, but still when I'm having conversations with people in America, people are like, oh wait, this happens. And oh my God, people want to harm my gay friend. Like pe some people, whether it's like they're in an accepting area, they just like, or they don't believe that like violence and discrimination is a thing because they don't experience it. They're like, oh my God, this is really happening. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not making this up. Like this is 2018 and there's death camps, but like, it's just crazy to me. It's just like this like, underfunded organization has been able to like push so many barriers and how much more we could do as young people. So remember millennials, we could do a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so where do you find inspiration and context to support your work? Oh, did you want it something oh, yeah. to say? Yeah. Sorry. I, I was gonna add one thing. Yeah, I think please. An another strength that Voices has is um, that there's a very, very specific intention um, to use the voice is not used to, to elevate, you know, voices of people who are actually in the community being affected. And there's, you know, a very specific um, decision to, uh, to, to basically only go into issues and, and, and advocate issues um, where, we, where we know those people in the community and therefore can make the most effective, um, you know, targeted efforts without you know stepping on anyone's shoes or, or putting anybody at risk um you know which i think ultimately you know c can make activism less efficient when, when you when you go in without kind of a holistic understanding of the situation mm. Mm -hmm. thank you now where do you find inspiration and context to support your work with the limited access to information and references from previous queer artists like even with all that's out there you know like it's still really hard to like being like oh yeah this author and that author whatever help you guide you um <laughs> i know it's a struggle no struggles yeah. of being queer artist hashtag <laughs> it is, it's hard um i mean you know when i was uh first getting into activism you know or getting into the issue i was i was actually only in um high school i was like a, a sophomore in high school and there was an open-ended project um you know in our, our like world history class and i you know i picked the issue of, of gay rights kind of globally um, and a lot of my resources were at the time, you know, Human Rights Watch, um, uh, Amnesty International, um, ILGA, I forget what that stands for, but, um, you yeah, know. International Lesbian Gay There you go, and that, that may be out right now? I don't, I'm not sure if they've. No, they're still separate. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so a lot of these major organizations, which actually have done a lot of really good in-depth work, um, and, uh, I mean, that definitely is an inspiration. I think, you know, a lot of other inspiration comes from from art and <laughs> that same year, uh, which is also the year I came out, I was very inspired by the poetry of like Allen Ginsberg, who talks about, you know, um, same-sex love. And I think, you know, you, you, you find the mediums that speak to you, um, but definitely, you know, human rights organizations have done a lot of good reporting if you, if you wanna look at, you know, facts and case studies and things like that. Cool. And what about you, John? Um, to find inspiration, right? Is that yeah. The I mean, there's just not enough people mm. to look up to, basically. Right now, yeah. Well, right now, it's a very interesting time because we, 
we had people who were kind of like these leaders that we are like written about or, s or, or, or seen on you know the media and right now it's becoming because you know what though hold on I have to say that maybe <laughs> that's a good thing I will argue that maybe it's because too many people now want to be a voice for minorities or I mean not like we're, we're not even a minority I mean like uh, the, the, the queer society uh, <laughs> part of the society of America like I like to, th I'm honestly, and maybe I'm just trying to be optimistic, or maybe I want to think like this until I'm done and gone, but I'm hoping that people, there's more people wanting to be a leader and a voice. But say without it. Without it. Without it. Like, how, how can you create something if you well, don't have, I mean, for example, like, I wrote a play, I shared Daniel, in, about five ex-Hasidic women who are all queer and are struggling with their custody battles. And I'm going through professors that have no experience or knowledge about these women. And there's not really much information out there about right. these, about how to portray them, how to write about them, how to represent them, how to cater to an American audience. And even me as being like non-binary, like I don't see anyone in society who's really non-binary and femme that I could right. reference on, that could help me guide through my life and my struggles. So, right. so often, the people that I'm going to, I have trouble getting suggestions from them because you can't water down my story, my narrative, because you haven't experienced it. But I also want to find a way to use my art, to channel my pain, to share the weight with the world, mm -hmm. and hopefully people understand and educate themselves. But that's kind of what I meant in terms of like how as I queer people, saying, right. because I mean, black people have came a far way in like this country. It's now there's so many films like reference off, but like still for queer people, because okay. it's stigmatized. Right. right, right, right. So I'll make sure to edit everything up till now <laughs> and that question. So yeah, I, it's definitely going to be tough. Okay, because in the sense that you know, growing up for me, you know, I would definitely say there's not many gay actors that represented gay characters in films, and that is a tough, a very tough moment to understand that. A, a friend of me, uh, a friend of mine, actually showed me a list of all films that deal that were well known, well rep like you know awards galore, and all of them are usually straight men. And people want to argue, does that you know, is that acting then? If you take away a straight guy doing a gay role, and I want to say no, because honestly, we just need more representation, and it, it is getting harder. I really don't know what to say to people in the sense of trying to find something now. I mean. For me, all I, for what I did was I looked back and I tried to find films. I tried to ignore the fact that it was a straight guy. I tried to find the truth in it, and I tried to find the inspiration in me. To Out of being a stigmatized right. representation. I mean, like people. I know that is tough, a tough pill to swallow. But in for our generation, I hate to say we're gonna have to go through that. I hope that we're big enough to be voices and media and f I like I honestly be your own directors I producers. honestly my, I'm, I'm I am about to do a short film that is an all gay cast um, uh -huh, and it's yes. about and it, 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 it's literally about how you know our our, our we're, we're getting a little too obsessed with phones and uh, relationships through phones and it's a very raw story about that and my point is that I hope we make more movies like that for people to see it's tough right now for us. We're gonna have to like go back and like swallow this pill and watching like Philadelphia. Great example. I mean, like, you can't. It's such a hard movie to hate because it was such a strong movie to change people's minds about being gay and having AIDS in the workplace. But Tom Hanks did it. Then again, Tom Hanks isn't the worst guy. But you know, when you look at a nitty gritty, because so it's Tom Hanks, people exactly. listen. Exactly. So I thank. I honestly thank him for doing that role. But I would like to see more of that in the future of an actual gay man, you know, portraying this role. And again, we're just gonna have to dig back and try to dig what we can find. What Thank you. Yeah, yeah and that's it's why tough. it's so important yeah. for people to keep creating. Yeah. And when I hear people are like, I can't draw, I can't write, I'm like, or even a small example, like I recently taught a class at MoMA and there was a kid that, I don't know if he was uncomfortable with me because of my gender identity and expression and who I am, and then they kind of like started messaging me after the class um, through email, and I guess like many other students, they saw that they could be represented in a way, even though they're a straight black man, um, and they just felt safe because they seemed like I was creating an open space for everyone, and they kept sending me their anime drawings, and it was mostly Dragon Ball Z, right. and I kept saying like, <laughs> that's great, you're a great illustrator, but I'm like, I want you to push forward, I wanna see, your background and culture in a Dragon Ball Z lens. And 
he was like, why this, that? And I was like, because we need to see that representation right. for other young black people right. who don't see themselves reflected in Dragon Ball right. Z and why it's so powerful every individual to create their story because it's not there yet. And also it's gonna do justice for so many other people. Also real quick, yeah, it is very easy to honestly start filming after watching Tangerine, and everybody should go watch Tangerine. You've yeah. seen Tangerine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like Sean Baker freaking like changed the game on filming. That was all done on iPhone. I mean, wow. most of my footage, I didn't know that. most of yeah. my footage is done on an iPhone. And there's there's a Canon in there, but I got the, the the ten, and you know Spielberg also recently said, who's an interesting guy to bring up. But I mean, it's Spielberg, and he did mention, you know, he had a super. <laughs> and someone asked him like, what do you do to get in? And honestly, he looked at everyone and was like, you all have iPhones. I mean, honestly. I don't think people realize how incredible that phone can really go a long way. Mm. And you can, uh, people can just go out there and start filming and making things look, honestly, cinematic. They New homework assignment for me. Yeah, Every uh, night honestly, make a film. Moment yeah. lenses, free fly um, uh, systems. Yeah, the little lens thing. That's a, a, a moment. I mean, that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sponsor them right now. Honestly, Moment is an amazing, amazing company and they're designed to make lenses for your phone. and. Your well, iPhone, unfortunately, we'll include it. Can't yeah. sponsor things. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 what I meant was that you know I am as a vocal, a vocal sponsor. So finally, um, what is message you have for other queer artists and media makers that are starting out to uplift their voices, and how else can we learn about your work? Um, yeah, I would just say, um, still kind of tagging along with the last question. I think you know one of the most important things, like you were saying, is to tell you know, your story, um, to be really truthful. And um, I think you know, the more you, um, you kind of aim at, at being honest, the more kind of universal that, that story ends up being. Um, I just, I know that um, th there has been, you know, w which I sort of failed to mention before, that there has been a lot of queer art you know, in, in theater. Um, and that's been, you know, a big. It's been very influential and and and, and helpful. Um, but I think a lot of the times we see things like La Caja Fall and um, such a great movie. Wait, right, great movie, great play, um, and Bird lots cage. lots of you know, lots of similar stories. But um, there's there are some you know it, there is certainly something universal about La Caja Fall as well. Um, but I think you know if we talk about the, you know, the real, you know, truthful stories of today, um, they're, they're very, they can be very accessible to, to even a straight audience, to a trans audience. Um, I think one thing that Love, Simon does is kind of showing that, which there, I have some, I have some, you know, personal qualms with it as well. A lot. Um, a lot. But, a lot. but that is A lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it certainly, it shows, it shows maybe a bit more of a like heteronormative, you know, high school experience, but something that it does do, you know, that is some people's experience. Mm -hmm. um, something that it does do is, is make, you know, the, the queer identity um, accessible and, 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 and finds kind of what is universal um, in that coming of age experience. Um, and yeah. what about where could we learn more about your work? Do you have like a Daniel Spergilia? <laughs> Spergilia? I'm sorry, I can't. No worries. I tried. I, I'm, 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 I'm working on an abbreviation. <laughs> okay, I know we talked about yeah. that. Well, um, don't change who you are, but still. Right, right. Uh, not yet. Insta um, well, you can find my Instagram, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my Instagram is Spriggs. Uh, that's that's one abbreviation. Probably not going to be the professional one, but S B R I G Z. Um, there, you know, will be you know as as I go along, I will be putting when clips up there. When we're going to see, is there like a date soon for your play? Um, Do we have a title? Isn't really, the Senegal play? Uh, no, I mean, I the the a title I've thought about is Gorge Again, which is um, it's the Wolof word uh, attributed to the sort of the queer identity that was present in Senegal before colonialism, um, which has been sort of turned into a dirty word now. It means man, woman. And there's this sort of gender queer element to it. It's, it's very flamboyant. Mm. And um, it What's the word again? Gorge again. Gorge again. Yeah. It, um, it, the gorge again, you know, were very much part of mainstream society, very well mm. respected. They had roles mm. in spiritual ceremonies. Um, 
you know, were connected to powerful female politicians, which were more prominent in Senegal before mm -hmm. the colonization period. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, if somebody hears that word, they they expect to be stoned to death. You know, it's, Got it. it's yeah. And John, we already know about your like docu series, right. so maybe mm. you could just talk about briefly about people who are starting out and yeah. want to build their voice. Yeah, I would definitely say um, if it's visual, mm -hmm. Instagram, uh, I would find your your way on there. Uh, I would definitely do an account, you know, uh, a business account, show what you're doing, label. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's honestly against what I like to say, but label yourself of what you do, uh, and. Uh, honestly, just, I mean, it, I will say this, I'll, I'll be very focused. If you want to film, just pick up your phone. Just like pick up your phone and go outside and you might be shocked on how good it is. Honestly, I don't know. That's all I, I really can say. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> so, th no, that's great. So thank you both today, yeah. Daniel and John. Um, we appreciate your time and experience with us and all the hard work you're doing and bringing positive visibility and justice to our community and muting of queer and trans folks around the globe, which we will be listing resources, as always, on our channel for you to plug in. So get out there and take your pen and paper, camera and creative eye and change the narrative for the better of this vibrant and diverse community. I can't wait to see what you have produced and send it to us at Queer Justice NYC on social media. I'm your host, Zizé Daniels. As always, be yourself, love yourself, and see you next time for our final episode of season one. Drum rolls, please. Trans rights in America, sashay away. <laughs> That's the first time he's sashay away. I wanted to be really cliche. That's so cute. Yeah. Thank you.